London calling to faraway towns And war is declared, the battle comes down London calling to the underworld Come out of the cover I mean to read from my book, but before we get to that You might wonder what the hell am I doing dressed up as a cowboy Well, as a little boy, growing up in England It's all they ever thought of, all they ever dreamed of, all they ever wanted was to be a cowboy which is how come I end up in Northampton, Massachusetts, I guess. The book is called Marmite Cowboy. Marmite because I love Marmite, and Cowboys because I love Cowboys, but only in the non-biblical sense. During the wee hours of Maundy Thursday, 1957, in a stone cottage in the shadow of our Gothic church, my mum and a squirmy little me, awash in amniotic fluid and blood, were manhandled through the birthing process by the drunken village doctor. In this endeavour, he was assisted by the district nurse, a no-nonsense northern woman of steady hand, one of a multitude of matriarchs who together with my mum, made me what I still am today, a Tidza lad. Tidza, short for Tideswell, the biggest village or smallest town in Derbyshire, sits in a green basin atop a limestone plateau, snaked with valleys and streams. The rocky hills, lush fields and spongy moorlands carry on till the soot-blackened red brick of Manchester in the west and Sheffield in the east. Even among Englishmen, the northernmost reaches of Derbyshire have inspired trepidation. In a tour through the whole island of Great Britain, published in 1724 by the dissenter Daniel Defoe, Derbyshire's high peaks are described as a howling wilderness. When growing up, I dreamed of going to America. A land of Oz, imagined from legends, swapped with my best friend Nidge, or from TV shows, movies, comic books, even from camel cigarette soft packs. An odd association, but one I will explain before long. The village lasses sit here to smoke fags and gossip, just like their mothers and grandmothers. The current crop wears mini skirts, overdone makeup, industrial strength mascara. Or was that the look their mothers affected? In a socio-economic brigadoon such as this, styles once thought fashionable never fully disappear. Creatures thought extinct continue to graze and irrigate. This is the actual flag. Here, let me, let me get back to where I was here. Okay, so Ninja and I went to our first big outdoor rock festival, which seemed like an American thing to do. It pains me to admit it, but I arrived at the festival wrapped in the American flag. And I was just back in England last week and my mum saved this. This is the actual flag that I went to the Buxton Rock Festival in. I arrived at the festival wrapped in the flag, literally. It was a moth-eaten shroud from the Second World War. A time when oversexed, overfed and over here expressed the British envy of Yanks for their relative wealth and surplus of New World exuberance. I bought the flag from a junk store at a local cattle market for 10 bob. I wanted to use it as a hanging in my bedroom. The flag was much too big for hanging, but it fitted on my bed once I'd folded it a few times. So now I was sleeping under the bloody thing like a dead president. The time had come to remove the flag from my bed and stuff it into my rucksack. We were off to the High Moors, where the Buxton Rock Festival was to take place at the site of a former munitions dump from the Allied assault on Germany. I had substituted my sleeping bag with the American flag, thereby providing me with a hip daytime accessory and nighttime bed all in one. Can you imagine sleeping this thing? It's made of hemp. It felt like ants on your body. And it's got the... the uh, the insulation quality of nothing. I had to get out of the, uh, the rain-soaked moorland uh, valleys of Derbyshire and get as close to America as I could. Drinking hot cups of tea by the cold Irish sea, trying to keep the chilling hot aches at bay. It were raw, it were wet, it were a day to forget when I saw her climb the steps to the prom. Where the brass band had long since stopped 
that dilly on pum 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 pum. I crossed the strip and walked along the other side amidst a torrent of activity. After a short walk, I called the Vegas vicar again. This time, he picked up and asked me where I was. He told me he'd pick me up on the strip at the corner of Fremont Street. 30 minutes later, I was driving along Las Vegas Boulevard with a vicar I'd met only once briefly in New York City. Sufficient cause, it would seem, for me to impose upon his Episcopalian hospitality. We drove to his rectory and he showed me my room. On my third night, Sandy, that's the vicar, got free tickets to a show at one of the casinos. It was a bizarre Wild West themed show with cowboys, live horses, a stagecoach and dancing girls. I remember we kept looking at each other and grinning at the spectacle of it all. I assumed he was enjoying the scantily clad high kicking girls but I later realized it was the cowboys he'd been watching. I lay thinking about the events of the past few days, Sandy's constant flattery and his challenges to my parochial views on sex. I felt sorry for him and I began to wonder what it would be like if I succumbed to his cajolery. He'd repeatedly said, it's no big deal. I just want to give you a blow. <laughs> Cheers. Drink, you bastards.